What is the job of a software developer? I think that the first thing that springs to most people's minds is writing code. But when you think of it, this is really a rather strange idea. It's a bit like saying that the job of a mechanic is using spanners or that a doctor's job is using thermometers. These aren't what people do or what the value that they add is. These are just some of the tools that they use. Code is no different. It's a tool that we use in our work. It isn't the work itself. I think that this is more than just a philosophical question. It has a direct impact on how we approach our work and directly on the relationship that we have with our employers. So if coding doesn't define the job of a software developer, what does? Oh, and one more question. Are you a doctor or a waiter? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis and Transfig. They support this channel, so please do support them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. If it isn't coding then, what is it that defines our job? I think that this is a bigger question than it may seem at first look. Software is important. It's important in the world. We're in the midst of a revolutionary change in our societies as a result of the impact of software. Our ability to wield software as a tool effectively is a key difference between success and failure for most businesses these days. Actually, it's our ability to wield the information at the heart of our systems that is the key to success. The software is the tool that allows us to wield it. So who makes the calls that impact on that success or failure? One of the most common themes in comments that I get in social media of different kinds is, I agree with what you're saying, Dave, but we can't do that here. Or to put it more simply, my boss won't let me do that. My friend, Jeff Patton, has a great way to express this idea. He says that the relationship between the product-focused people and the technologists is very often wrong and a big source of our problems. He says it should be more like the relationship that you have with a doctor, but is more frequently like the relationship that you have with a waiter. With a waiter, we place an order for what it is that we want. I'll have steak, medium with salad, and please hold the dressing. We may ask for suggestions or advice, but ultimately we're laying out a series of instructions to describe what it is that we want and how we want it prepared. We're in control because Probably we're the best place to know what it is that we want. Conversations with your doctor are really very different. What's wrong with me, doc, and how do I fix it? If we ask the waiter for advice, we don't really feel any pressure to take it. If we ask the doctor for advice, though, and then ignore it, there is kind of an assumption that we're probably doing something a bit dumb. It may ultimately be our call, but it isn't usually wise to ignore a doctor's advice. That's because they offer advice from a perspective of evidence and of stuff that works, rather than personal choices and subjectivity. These drugs will fix you 99% of the time versus I prefer the fish. I like this analogy. If your bosses or just another part of the organisation are telling you what to develop and how, you're a waiter. If you don't test or refactor your code or spend some of your time working on things that cure problems and so improve the efficiency of your team because of a schedule pressure, you're a waiter with a dumb customer. We need to be more like doctors. We need to be responsible for our own work and we need to take that responsibility seriously. Unfortunately, that sometimes means having tricky conversations and giving people bad news. People often want things that are either unrealistic or just plain dumb. We have to represent an engineer's rational viewpoint in these conversations. For me, the idea of engineering is more than just a different word to use for what it is that we do. It implies some important additions. It's about using approaches that work 
to maximise our chances of success and having some evidence of what worked in the past, not just because these things are the flavour of the month. There are no guarantees here. We're just maximising our chances of success, not guaranteeing it. But that's still a big step forward from making decisions based on what looks cool or because the cool kids are doing it. My working definition is this. Software engineering is a scientifically rational approach to solving practical problems within economic constraints. It's about looking at problems a bit more dispassionately. It's not really about what I like or what I don't. It's about what works or what doesn't. To be able to move beyond subjectivity and fashion, we need a way of figuring out what it is that works. An engineering approach doesn't define answers, but it does something more important than that. It gives us an approach to ruling out bad ideas. It doesn't do this perfectly. Engineers miss things all the time and make, make mistakes too, but it does it better than the alternatives because that's really what it's for, to offer some kind of guide rails that help to steer us in a direction towards better decisions. We don't really have that in software very much. There's little agreement on what defines good in software. That means that we, more than other technical disciplines, are pretty terrible at disregarding bad ideas. I think that software engineering should be defined by two things, optimising for learning and optimising for managing complexity. Optimising for these things are guide rails that will steer you towards a higher chance of success. These still aren't the goals of our job though, but they are tools that we can use to better help us achieve the real goals. They define a kind of fitness function that we can use to test ideas with, a direction of travel toward better systems and more efficient ways of making them. Does this change, new technology or way of organising meetings, allow us to learn faster or help us to better compartmentalise the system or our understanding in a way that helps us to manage its complexity? We should own our expertise in this area. We are the people that do the work and see and sometimes suffer from bad choices. I think that we need to establish a stronger belief in what really works and what really matters when trying to further the interests of the organisations that employ us. So rather like doctors who are trained in an approach to medical diagnosis and treatment, we should learn the tools of our trade, becoming expert at learning and managing complexity. Then we can apply these skills to every problem that we face. This includes the problem of how best to organise ourselves in teams and groups and how to organise our work so that we can do the best job that we can. I'm not saying that we should do this in isolation from other people, but this should be much more like a collaborative partnership than a process of responding to a series of orders and issuing instructions. Our real job, the thing that we are genuinely employed to do, is not to write code or even to practise engineering or craft. It's to solve problems. But we, and no one else, are the experts at solving problems with computers. We know what that takes better than other people. So why do technical teams so often end up acting like waiters? So what does exerting this kind of control look like? How do we start to exert it if our organisation doesn't already work like that? I think that, as usual, the answer to this is to proceed in small steps, rather than planning or waiting for some sea change in understanding and opinion. It doesn't really help sitting and looking at the rest of the organisation and thinking, they're all idiots. Whether that's true or not, approaching it from that perspective is not going to help us make progress. In general, I'm an optimist, or at least I present a close simulation of one. I try to assume that most people aren't idiots, but I also assume that not everyone's opinion has equal value on every topic. I'm not very good at lots of things. I'm not an expert on finance or medicine or telecoms, but I've worked in all these industries and a few more, and I hope I added value. But I would always defer to someone that was an expert in the problem that we were working on together. I may ask lots of questions, 
No, scratch that. I will ask lots of questions to try to understand better. I may offer suggestions to try and find new ways to approach the problem, because after all, solving problems with computers is part of my expertise. And solving problems with computers doesn't always, even usually, mean simply automating the process that the experts began with. But there are limits to the challenges that I'm going to make to experts. I'm not going to try and impose my opinion of how markets work on a trader or what the rules are in a regulated industry if I have access to an expert who really knows the answers, even when I don't like the answers that I get. Equally, I am more expert in software, so if we are talking about how we can and should apply software to any of these problems, I expect non-technical people to trust that I'm doing my best to help them and that my advice and understanding is probably worth listening to. Because I probably know a bit more than them about that part of the problem and how we can use software to solve it together. We factor in all of our collective experience to come to better decisions. Our job at that point is to be the expert on the creation of software offering our best advice based on our knowledge, experience and understanding. This is a different conversation than discussing things with other technologists. Now, my opinions are as good as anybody else's and we can debate in detail, sometimes loudly, because we share some background and experience to come up with the closest refined ideas. What this means in practice, though, is that we need to be comfortable in owning the responsibility for our stuff and, to some extent, demonstrating our confidence in our ideas and discussions and assertions with other people. To be able to do that with any credibility, we need to understand why we hold the views that we hold, and so be in a position to defend them, if need be. We need a model for what it is that we're talking about. I suppose that this is one of the things that I hope to help with on this channel, to offer my suggestions for a rationale of how software development really works. My own approach to this is that I try to be very rational. I try to maintain this mental model of what works and why it works and how it fits with the other things that work. I think I can explain the reasons why any of the practices that I recommend are, in my experience, the best choice to myself and to others. You may not agree with, with specific practices, but I can explain why I think that they're a good idea to anybody, technical or not. It's not as good to go to your boss and say, I did this with test-driven development because everybody knows test-driven development is best. Or, I did this with test-driven development because I wanted to add it to my CV and Dave Farley said it was a good idea. Those are reasons from fashion and from authority and don't really tell us anything useful. But saying, I did it with test-driven development because it helps me to improve my design and reduces bug counts significantly so that we can avoid rework and build better software faster is a fundamentally better kind of explanation. It would be a better explanation even if it was factually wrong. It's not. But even if it was, it's better because at least you've shown that the reason why you're trying it is aimed at improving the outcomes that really matter better software faster. So my first two pieces of advice are to take responsibility for our own work first. Don't allow others to dictate that what doing a good job means for you. By all means, listen to advice, particularly if you have access to people who you respect and can learn from. Don't break the rules of the team. If the team agrees on an approach, stick to it. But within the scope of your own work, for the stuff that you do day to day, do work that you can be proud of. Don't ask permission for things like writing tests if they help you, and they will, or refactoring your code as you work, or taking a little time to think about the design and how to improve the code in ways that matter and that will allow you to manage its complexity. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for perfection to happen elsewhere before you start making your own work as good as you can. The second part of this, though, is to also do this in a responsible way. Do this because you genuinely and hopefully rationally can make a case for why this will make things better. Not just for you, but for the team and the organisation too. 
If you start taking responsibility for doing a good job of your own stuff, applying your understanding and expertise in trying to do that, and you can give an understandable reason why this good job matters and is in the interest of the wider team or organisation, I think that you will be in a pretty dysfunctional organisation if people don't value that. Also, you can hold your head high and take pride in your own work. If anyone does tell you off or questions your approach, you have a defensible rationale for why what you're doing is better and in their interests. None of this means that you may not still end up in an uncomfortable conversation. But you should now have more confidence in your own reasons and a more effective way to explain your motivations. This may still not convince some people, but now you have a bit more evidence that these people are really idiots after all. To support this, we need frameworks of understanding that help us to test our ideas and so make it easier to explain them to other people. I think that seeing ourselves as problem solvers rather than only coders helps with this. Part of that means learning about the problems that we are trying to solve. Now, some of the things that make being able to do this may be difficult. They're likely to be down to how firms are structured and organise their work. Too many firms suffer from trying to micromanage technical decision making. Requirements that aren't requirements, they're just instructions on what to implement. And architecture and design decisions made far from the development of the software. These are all anti-patterns and don't work very well. Great software is built by engaged, interested people who understand the problems that they're working on and have the freedom to make choices that help them to solve those problems. So we need to optimise for those things. If you work in anything but a very small team, you're probably going to struggle to change any of this directly. So one of the ways to begin the move to gaining more control from inside a team like this is to start to influence things at its edges. You can't force everyone to do better, but maybe you can help the people that you interact with most closely to do better. There are three common friction points at the edges of a development team. Requirements, schedule and operations. I'm not going to talk about operations today, but watch some of my DevOps videos for my take on that aspect. The commonest problem with requirements and schedule actually result from the same cause, micromanagement. Schedules that track individual tasks, productivity measures for individual developers and requirements that specify solutions rather than needs are all measuring or unspecifying the wrong things. The tasks don't matter and how you achieve some goal doesn't matter as much as the goal does. So start to work on isolating these things. Bring the task definition and the task allocation into the scope of the team. Don't have somebody outside the team doing those things. After you get the requirements, that's the time to look at task decomposition. I've seen development teams reject stories because they didn't tell them precisely what code to write. This doesn't specify the validation rules for this field, so the, we can't implement it. Now, you're part of the problem, reinforcing the assumption that you need micromanaging are on, and on a team of waiters. I've also seen dev teams that don't understand the context of what they're working on, sometimes not even knowing what their software does or who uses it. You need to know these things to do a good job. Dev teams should be responsible for the design, testing and implementation of the systems that they build. They should understand the problems that they're solving. The job of requirements is to say what software needs to do from the perspective of a user. If your requirements don't do that, those are the ones to push back against. Push back on stories that describe how to implement something. Ask for stories that describe an outcome that users will get once the software is finished. Teach the people at the edges how to do a better job of this stuff. Everyone's goal is to make software development easier, not harder. And that means focusing everyone more clearly on the outcomes that matter, not the technicalities along the way. Those things are our job and our responsibility as technologists. The goal is to help development teams to build better software faster. It's in everybody's interest to do that.
And the experts at knowing how to build better software faster are the people that do it. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to support this channel further, please do check out our Patreon site. Go to Patreon and look for Continuous Delivery. Thanks again.